Good evening, Calvary Chapel. Blessings to you all. And uh, may the Lord just really occupy this space. Amen. Father, we just come to you, Lord, and we thank you again and again and again. We can never thank you enough, Lord, just how grateful, Lord, we are for your blessing, for your touch, for, Lord, just your presence. And, Lord, for just the, the joy, uh, inexpressible, Lord, that you give to us. And, Father, just everything that you give. If only your son came, that would be more than enough, Lord. And so, Father, we, we just rejoice in you, Lord. And we're just so grateful, Lord, for all that you've done. And we ask, God, that you would just bless our time together tonight, that you would bless and honor your word, Lord, in spite of me, Lord. Just use it to draw us closer and closer to you. And Father, we just long for you, and we long for your presence. And we ask God also for the pouring out of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, be with our voices as we praise your name. Be with us, Lord, as we, Lord, listen and receive from you and from your word. And, Lord, just take tonight as we give it into your hands. And we give you ourselves, Lord. We ask, God, that you would just use tonight as we seek and search you. Lord, just draw us closer and closer to you. We love you. And we just praise you now in Jesus' name. And everyone said. Amen. All who are thirsty. All who are weak. Will come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the ways of his mercy. As deep cries out.
us love, send us power, send us grace. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Well, Lord, listen to your children praying. Spirit in this place. Oh Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Send us love, send us power. Send us grace, send us love, send us power, send us grace. We are a moment, you are forever. Lord of the ages, God before time, we are a vapor, you are eternal, love everlasting.
you, God. Your name is that strong tower that we can run into, God, when the world is getting too much. Lord, it's never too much for you. You're almighty. You're the I am that is self-sufficient. You, you need nothing. You're everything. You're so good and so perfect and so wise. We can trust in you, God, with all of our heart. We can not lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you so that you'll make that path straight and known to us, God, as we draw near to you. We thank you so much for inviting us here. We invite you, God, to do what you need to do in us. Lord, we just open our hearts to you tonight, Lord. We lay ourselves at your altar. We lay down that burden at the foot of the cross, God, and we take up your burden that's light. Father, we thank you for this time just to be in your presence. You're so good to us all the time. We adore you, Jesus. We love you. We worship you. We honor you. Oh, God, we just want your name to be so lifted up. Be our strength. Be our hope. Be our vision. We love you, Jesus, in your precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Love one another.
Okay, hello everybody. It's another Wednesday. In fact, the month is almost over. I mean, it's halfway. It sure went fast. What's that? <laughs> yeah. I know, man. It just it just goes too fast. It just seems like it, time goes faster and faster. You know. So I don't know. Anyway, the pastor is going to be reading tonight. Leviticus 12 and 13. So what I decided to do was, I'm going to read the whole chapter of 12. It's eight verses long. <laughs> okay. And Leviticus 12 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived and born a male child... Then she shall be unclean for seven days. Fritz what? What are you guys are off? <laughs> are you okay now? <laughs> Here I was doing so good. <laughs> I thought you were laughing about that she was unclean for seven days. Wait, to, wait, wait till she gets the she, if she had a girl. Okay, anyway. Um, and as in days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. On the eighth day, the flesh of, of his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall then continue the blood of her purification for 33 days. She shall not touch any hollow thing or come into the sanctuary until the days of her purification, purification are fulfilled. But if she bears a female, then she shall be unclean for two weeks. I don't know why, but as in customary impurity, and she shall continue in the blood of her purification 66 days. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then she shall, she shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. And she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who has borne a male or a female. And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves and, or two young pigeons, one as a burnt offering, the other as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. So that's a whole chapter. I read a whole chapter. <laughs> Okay, the pastor's getting ready to come on up, so let's pray. Okay, Heavenly Father, thank you for another day that you have given us. Thank you for answered prayer. Thank, thank you for everything that you do for us. You're just so good to us, and we just don't deserve any of it. But we do praise you and love you and thank you for who you are. 
Please anoint our pastor tonight as he teaches us from your word. And we do praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. God is good. I mean, all the time. I'm going to sit down if that's okay with you guys. Ah. How are you guys doing? Good to hear it. Just one second here to get myself. All right. So let's look at Leviticus. And uh, chapter 12. As seen in the sacrifices, we know that's chapters 1 through 7, dealt with worshiping the Lord. Here in chapter 11 and on through to chapter 17, the subject matter is walking with the Lord. So worshiping the Lord, and now we're dealing with walking with the Lord. As we went through chapter 11, I just wanted to pick up on something there for a moment. Uh, eight chapters is a short chapter, short book, so, uh, sorry, sorry, eight verses is a short chapter. And uh, it won't take long, but uh, there's some other things I wanted to share with you tonight, too, as well. Uh, and, and basically, it has to do with, with chapter 11, because as we got into chapter 11, you know that we begin to deal with the dietary laws that God had established. And it's important for us to realize that these were more or less what I would refer to as health codes that the Lord wanted them to abide by for really their own benefit. Uh, health laws, if you would, that he established. And they don't necessarily apply to us today uh, we know that we're not under the law. And yet, there is a reason why God commanded the children of Israel to follow these dietary practices. Now, with some of the things that God forbid them to eat, a lot of people, including myself, have no problem with it whatsoever. Because <laughs> I wouldn't want to eat those things anyways. But with the other things that were forbidden to eat, there are many who rather enjoy them and love to, to eat them. And these would be things like, you know, clam chowder and shrimp and lobster. And, and yet, these were crab legs, you know, kind of thing. And these were some of the things that were forbidden to eat under the law, but we pretty much looked at that last week. Um, but you could look at them and you could see the reason why. Now, I say that and I introduce that simply to say there's an interesting book that you, if you can find it, you might be interested in, in reading it while we're in this particular section. It was written by a guy named Dr. Maxwell. And the book's title is None of These Diseases. For after God finished giving to them this law about what to eat and what not to eat, he gave to them a conditional promise. And it says this, If you will keep my law and my statutes, then none of these diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians will come upon you. And Dr. Maxwell takes the premise, and rightly so, that what God was establishing for them was a health code. And if they would be obedient, much as we see throughout the scriptures, and especially Isaiah chapter 6, if you are obedient and if you do these things, the Lord will give you a taste of the good lamb, of that which is good. But if you would be obedient and follow the health code that God had given to them, then they would not be plagued with a lot of the diseases that the Egyptians were plagued with. And that really 
this is just good, sound advice for you to follow. Especially when you get into the aspects of cleanliness, which is what we will look a little bit at as far as the uh, birth of kids in chapter 8. But the, the washing after touching dead objects and everything that goes along kind of with that is so important. Um, after touching someone who's had a running sore, you know, things of that, that nature, uh, you are to wash or you were to wash and you're to be unclean until the evening and, and everything that falls in order with that. And he points out how wise the law of God was and pointed out how that medicine for years had such a high mortality rate because it used to be sort of a, a feeling among the surgeons that the bloodier you looked when you came into the room, that the more sufficient or proficient, I should say, the more proficient you were as a surgeon. So the more bloody you were, the more blood you had on it's like, wow, you're a great surgeon. Can you do my operation? But it's not the same any, anymore. Um, but, the, the, you know, that's the way they kind of looked at it. And they would go from one patient to the other, not changing their garments at all and not washing their hands. They would come in with bloody clothes and bloody hands to perform a surgery and they were actually, what they were doing is transmitting disease from patient to patient. And they had, and they experienced a very high mortality rate. The doctor who first suggested, though, that they begin washing thoroughly, you know, like they do, um, kind of a bacterial type wash or washes that they would carry out. But this one individual suggested they begin to do it a different way, almost had his license taken away for his bizarre and novel ideas about washing. And yet he was able to demonstrate in the hospital that he was directing a very sharp decrease, especially in infant mortality, when they started observing very careful patterns of washing and bathing and cleansing, and all that goes along with it. And going from patient to patient, and from operation to operation, none of these diseases by Dr. Maxwell, uh, you'll find it very fascinating, a very fascinating book that deals with this particular section of Scripture as God more or less gets now into the health codes for his people. And I think it's fascinating, it's intriguing anyways, when you, you see doctors going back to the Bible for some instruction on cleanliness and, you know, in the right way, preparing themselves for what the Lord would have for them. And so, interesting, interesting stuff. So, as sort of an overall backdrop, it should be noted that God did not put the same prohibitions upon the Gentile believers at the time of the church that he put on upon Israel. He didn't put the same burden upon them. In other words, when the Gentiles began to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Jews, some of them felt that they had to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised in order to be saved. But the first church council, you remember, met together and assembled there in Jerusalem they dealt with that very issue. And it was determined that they would not put upon the Gentile believers what they referred to as a yoke of bondage, which is what Peter called it. That is, the law, a yoke of bondage. That which they weren't even able to keep themselves. Why would you put it upon the Gentiles? Why would you do that? And that's what the question was that came up because... Not only were they not able to keep it, but their fathers also were not able to keep it. And so James is the one that finally stepped forth with the suggestion. And he suggested that they write to them, telling them, Hey guys, just keep yourself from idols. 
and from things that are strangled. And if you do this, then you do well. You remember when Peter was on the housetop of Simon, the tanner there in the city of Joppa, in prayer on and about the noon hour. And as they were fixing him lunch downstairs, he had a vision. There was a sheet that was let down from heaven. And upon the sheet were all kinds of animals, clean and unclean, according to the law of Moses. Now, the Lord spoke to Peter at this particular time and told Peter, rise and kill and eat. And Peter said in response, not so, Lord. I can't do, you know Peter. Peter's always hoof and mouth kind of disease. That's one they couldn't forbid or keep from happening, but that's, that's where it was. And so Peter looked at the, up at the Lord and he said, Lord, I've never eaten anything that wasn't kosher. And the Lord said to Peter, do not call that which I have cleaned unclean. Don't call that unclean which I have cleansed. Now so many of the things that were forbidden by the law, though we know from a health standpoint why they were forbidden, and yet they're not forbidden to the Gentiles today. Yet we perhaps would probably be much healthier in some cases if we did not eat those things. Probably translates into almost a surety. You know, from a health standpoint. But as you look at these things, you know, what we know that they would benefit us if we didn't eat them. Knowing that they're not forbidden to the Gentiles. Knowing that we'd probably, like I said, most likely be more healthier in some cases. If we didn't eat those things. If we do eat them, he goes on to say that there's certain precautions that should be taken in their preparation in order that you not get sick. And so the Lord, first of all, begins with the animals in verse, chapter 11 that could be eaten, and he, you know, the hoof thing and the whole thing that we talked about, and those that shouldn't be eaten. And then he moves on to this section about childbirth and natural childbirth. But before launching into this new section in chapter 12, we need to kind of set the mood a little bit by describing or learning a little bit about childbirth and about natural childbirth. I think Bill Cosby had the best way of describing what a woman goes through when she gives birth. He says, this is the time when your wife is in such great pain and she wants to try and convey to you just how much pain that she is in. And so what she does is she grabs you by the lower lip. She pulls it up and she wraps it around your head. And she yells at you, you did this to me. That's Bill Cosby's take on it. It has been rightly said that the Bible is a book no man could write even if he would. And no man would write even if he could. You see, even if a man wanted to write the Bible, he would be unable to do so for this book was not authored by human ingenuity. It is unlike any other book that, in that it wasn't written by mortal men, but by God. By God who inspired man specifically and exactingly concerning every word which was written. One example of the uniqueness of the book before you, that you carried in with you hopefully this, this evening, is that a full third of it deals with prophecy. Deals with predicting events before they take place. And although no other religious writing dares to deal so much in the realm of prophecy, over 300 prophecies were given 
concerning the coming of Christ in the Old Testament, each of them being fulfilled to the letter. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 21 through 23. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they may be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come there hereafter, that we may know that you are God's, yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come let them show unto them. And then lastly, Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none that is like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Basically, you see our Father, our Heavenly Father, our God, challenging other gods to set things in order because He knows that they are unable to do it. They do not have the power, they do not have the ability to do or to predict what is to be with accuracy. No other, religion, no other religion has dared accept the challenge lest their fraudulence would come to light. And so no man could write this book, even if he would. But also no man would write this book even if he could. If someone were to be able to write a seemingly divinely inspired book in and of his own energy... He wouldn't write a book like this one. You say, why? Because of chapters like the one before us. A chapter that if I were writing the Bible, I wouldn't necessarily include. And so with that, notice verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days, as in the custom or in the days of her customary impurity, she shall be unclean. And so after the giving of birth to a baby boy, a baby boy, not a girl, a woman was considered ceremonially unclean, unable to take part in tabernacle worship for seven days. This first period of uncleanness is a total separation from others. A mother is not to come into contact with a lot of people in the first week. But then on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And so the baby boy was to be circumcised on the eighth day because not only is eight the number of new beginnings, but physiologically the day the eighth day is, the day when the blood coagulates. The rite of circumcision. A specific mark placed upon a Jewish male alone. And it spoke of dealing with the flesh. The fact that it was to be, take place as soon as it was physiologically possible speaks of the fact that sin is to be dealt with from the earliest of days in the earliest of times. 
Now as to what circumcision was, it was a sign between God and his people. A way of telling that they were his. They belonged to him. Circumcision, we know, began with Abraham. It was a picture of the cutting away of the flesh. That God's people were not to live after the flesh, but they were to live after the spirit. And that's what it indicated. The imparting, if you would, of spiritual values. That was the beginning of it. It starts from the very beginning. You don't wait until they're fully grown, a fully grown heathen to start teaching your children God's ways. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 21, it says, When the eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, speaking of Jesus, his name was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So the baby's name was given at circumcision. Verse 4, she shall then continue in the blood of her purification 33 days. She shall not touch any hallowed thing, nor come into the uh, sanctuary until the days of her purification are fulfilled. And so following the circumcision of the baby, the mother was considered to be ceremonially unclean for an additional 33 days. And so the mother continued in the state of uncleanliness this additional 33 days. That makes a total of 41 days of separation. And so why uncleanness at childbirth? Some possibilities. At least some aspects are probably hygienic. A woman continues with a flow of blood after childbirth. And it may have to do with keeping infection from setting in. Protecting the mother from uncleanness with germs that can be spread through and by the blood. And actually it might even also be a blessing for the mother. Because think about it. She's allowed a chance, a greater chance to recuperate from the birth of her child. And for the most part to keep any other kids husbands or anybody else in disfavor away from her so that she can rest and get healthy. Verse 5, but if she bears a female child, oh oh boy, if she bears a female child, then she'll be unclean for two weeks. Now you can run with that however you want, but I didn't say anything about it. Unclean for two weeks, as in her customary impurity. And she shall continue in the blood of her purification for 66 days. Not 33, double that, 66 days. So if she gave birth to a boy, a mother was ceremonially unclean for a total of 41 days. If she gave birth to a girl, she was ceremonially unclean for a total of 80 days, basically. Why was she unclean twice as long if she gave birth to a girl? The reason most commentators feel is because through circumcision, the sin of the baby boy was addressed. It was dealt with. He was born into this world in sin. Circumcision was a cutting away of the flesh. It was significant for that reason and satisfied the the requirement, if you would, of this impurification. But the sin of the baby girl could not be addressed in that way. It couldn't be addressed with circumcision for obvious reasons. And so leaving the mother alone here at this point to deal with the issue of sin is what took place. Now, why would either mother or baby have to deal with sin, you say? Why would the birth of either a son or a daughter be considered unclean? When we have babies, people send flowers, they buy balloons and they celebrate. What then is the meaning of this chapter? Is the birth process something that is unclean? And the answer to that is no. For it was God himself who said, be fruitful 
and multiply. Genesis 1.28. In this passage, God is doing something. He's illustrating for us something that is difficult for people today to comprehend or to embrace. He's declaring that when a baby is born, as glorious and as wonderful an event as that is, it causes uncleanness because another sinner is added to the world. Right? In Psalm 51, under inspiration of the Spirit of God, David declares, in sin did my mother conceive me. Right? Psalm 51, verse 5. And so at the moment of conception, there was sin. Not in the act of procreation, but at the moment of conception, a sin nature began. And this is the doctrine of the depravity of man. The depravity of man. We are all guys depraved. We're depraved politically. We're depraved in many other ways really politically incorrect or politically yeah, incorrect as, as much as it might be. But true nonetheless. Now contrary to current psychological thought, and it's really gone off the, the, the bricks with woke and CTR or CRT and all these things are out there. But at that moment of creation, there was sin. Not in the act of procreation, but at the moment of conception, a sin nature began. And that is the doctrine of the depravity of man. But it's true, no matter how much you might disagree with it, nonetheless. Now, contrary to current psychological thought, babies don't arrive with a clean slate. Man is not a sinner because he sins, he sins because he's a sinner. Let me repeat that. Man is not a sinner because he sins, but he sins because he is a sinner. And when you and I understand this, the implications and the applications are profound. First, an understanding of the depravity of man affects me parentally. I'm going to go over just four things that that impact us through this depravity of, of man. It affects us, first of all, parentally. And then what do I mean by that? Well, how I view my kids and the way I raise my family is how it affects me. To understand that a baby comes into the world as a sinner and not as an innocent little person who is bruised by culture or infected by civilization it makes me realize that as great as he is, that little boy is, and as much joy as she brings, they are sinners just like you and just like me as we came into this world. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Foolishness, rebelliousness, and sin are built, the Bible says, into the heart of the child. If you have kids, you know this to be so. You know it to be true because no one, as a parent, has ever had to teach his kids how to have a temper tantrum, right? They've got that one all figured out all by themselves. They do. They don't have to worry about going to school to learn how to throw a tantrum when they don't get their way. Not one of them had to teach their child, a parent, how to lie. They've got that down. Didn't have to teach them how to be sneaky. Didn't have to teach them how to be deceptive. No one says, today I'm going to teach my kids how to sin. Nobody does that because they do it very well all by themselves. And so in response, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24 says, He who spares his rod hates his son. 
But he who loves him disciplines him promptly. God knew exactly what he was doing when he said that the way to deal with sin in our kids is to do so lovingly with the rod of correction. Tears flow, guilt is released, hugs follow, kiss, kiss, hug, hug, and they can go free from the baggage and the guilt of sin. And so again, firstly, if you guys are writing these down, what do you got? Huh? Proverbs 22.13. Parentally, it affects us. That's what I'm looking for. And so first, an understanding of the depravity of men affects me parentally and you parentally. Secondly, an understanding of the depravity of man affects us politically. Communism made great strides as Karl Marx insisted that there should be comradeship, a brotherhood between all men, because men, they said, are basically intrinsically good. But the Bible begs to differ. The Bible says that men are basically intrinsically bad. That is why communism ultimately collapsed. Capitalism survived because it's actually based on the depravity of man. That is, that man is greedy and he will, therefore, work to the degree that he is personally rewarded. It is co-relational. Thirdly, an understanding of the depravity of man affects how I see myself personally. How I see myself personally. In Romans chapter 7, Paul declared, in my flesh dwells no good thing. Therefore, I don't have to be shocked or down on myself when I'm aware of sin within me. Instead, I can look at it and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, Take it away from me. Lord, deal with me because I know the sin deep within me will destroy me and will destroy my family. But God commendeth his love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. An understanding of my own depravity actually gives me and you, a great deal of security. Why? Because I realize who I am and the extent of God's love for me. I recognize it. I realize it. And then lastly, finally, an understanding of the depravity of man affects me relationally. Because we're all sinners, I never need to be disappointed by someone else's sin. Neither do you. We're all sinners. You don't need to be disappointed. All weak like sheep, the Bible says, have gone astray. Isaiah 53, verse 6. We have all rebelled against God. That's why Paul determined to know no man after the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul didn't focus on the flesh. Instead, he chose to see people in the spirit. To see what the Lord was doing in their life. To see what the Lord was accomplishing in their life. And so, verse 5, we see the number 66 days when a baby, baby girl was born. The time was lengthened. The initial complete separation was two weeks instead of one. And the total time of separation 80 days instead of 40. Why the difference again, you ask for girls? There doesn't seem to be any kind of medical explanation to this. Even though the ancient Greeks, at the suggestion of their, their own physician, Hippocrates, had a mother lay up for 42 days for a girl and 30 days for a boy. Some have suggested that the shorter time for the boy again had something to do with the fact that the boy had been circumcised and had paid kind of price, if he would, of his own. Others suggest that 
it might have been giving a mother and the daughter a longer time to bond. Yeah, don't know about that, though. Maybe it was a b greater blessing for the girls. Who knows? But verse 6 says, When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the term, uh, tabernacle of meeting. You look at this and you say, well, why a sin offering? Had a mother sinned in giving birth? One commentator said it may have been a rash or harsh word the mom might have spoken while giving birth. You know how those moms are. Maybe a cursing of the father or calling him names a la Bill Cosby, you know. Perhaps it was just a lesson about getting back in fellowship. Just like the priest had to present sin offerings from time to time before performing their ministry. They had to take care of business. But verse 7 says, Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her. And she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who was born a male or a female. And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One is a burnt offering, the other is a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her, and she will be clean. Just as the woman would bring an offering, God says, you know what, I have an offering to cleanse you, to purify you, to wash away the sin that you've done today, yesterday, and tomorrow. The lamb being the most costly offering required, it speaks of the lamb of God, whose blood was shed that we might be a forgiven people. A lamb was brought by the woman who brought a sinner into the world. And a lamb was brought by the Father who brought salvation to the world. It didn't matter if a family was rich or if the family was poor. Everyone is able to do it God's way. If you were too poor to afford a lamb to sacrifice, you could always bring two turtle doves or two pigeons to the sacrifice. This is what Jesus' family did at his birth. In Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now in the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed. They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This kind of gives us a clue to the family of Jesus, that they were simple, poor folks. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you through his poverty might become rich. He gave up the riches of heaven to become a poor man on earth so that we might have riches, the riches of heaven one day. And so now flipping over to the New Testament, to the gospel according to Luke, when Mary had fulfilled her days of purification. She comes to the temple with two turtle doves, again, indicating that Mary and Joseph were first and foremost poor, but they weren't able to afford a lamb. Secondly, at this time, when she came, it was not for the rite of circumcision, but it was for the rite of cleansing of her purification. Having born a child, and so it was 40 days after the birth of Jesus that Simon 
lifted him up in his arms and blessed God. Who was Simon? He was the one that cried and asked God, before I die, let me see the Messiah. And so Mary brought Jesus to Simon. And Simon lifted him up in his arms and he blessed God. Because if you remember, God had promised Simon that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. And so he said, now, Lord, let your servant die in peace, for I have seen your salvation. It was when Jesus was 40 days old that this particular thing transpired there in the temple. She had finished the days of her purification. Being poor, they brought turtle doves instead of a lamb and made their sacrifice unto the Lord. Therein is the law of childbirth. Amen. I told you it would be a little shorter. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for accounting for every detail that would be required. Lord, just for each and every one of these occasions, the sacrifices, the birth of a child. And Lord, I'm sure that we will know these things more fully when we come to be with you. But for now, we just need to look at it and meditate on it and chew the cud, so to speak. As we do, Lord, with every one of your scriptures, texts, chapter, verse, book. Lord, give us wisdom as we study. Lord, even in this, we might perhaps find more to be gained and gleaned if we were just simply to sit down and say, Lord, teach me, show me, reveal yourself to me. Father, we just want to thank you for your goodness and your love. That's why. Because of how good you are to us. How good you are to our Lord. His Mother Mary and Father Joseph. And ask, Lord, that you would just give to us that same wisdom day in and day out. That, Father, you would reveal yourself to us. And that if it's in the form, Lord, of a health code or in the form of some instruction from your word. That, Father, we would see it, understand it, grab a hold of it, and that, Lord, we would just live it through our life, applying it to our life. That, Father, we might benefit from your law, that we might benefit from, Lord, even though we're not bound by the law, that your rules, your regulations. For Lord, it was with great wisdom that you gave them. So Father, we pray that you, Lord, would help us, Lord, to attend to and pay attention to, Lord, every single detail as you lay it out, even here in Leviticus. For, Lord, we love you. Fill us now, Lord, with your wisdom. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Continue, Lord, to teach us and to draw us close to you because that's where we want to be. <laughs> Lord, be with us tonight as we go. Keep us safe and keep us ready, instant in season and out of season. 
Lord, just to give forth your word and testimony of what you have accomplished in our lives. So we love you. We give you the glory and the honor and the praise, both now and forever. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Love one another, guys. You got a little extra time to catch up tonight.